All right, everyone, in today's class, we are going to continue with neurology. And um, whenever you see H.J. Simpson here and his very small, fast operating brain, you know, it's still this topic of neurology. It's a pretty big topic. And to just review the basic concepts to the neural system, the neural system is highly adaptive. It is um, always learning, growing, sprouting. Um, and that's the beauty of the neural system. I mean, we can learn a new behavior, learn a new um, movement, and then be kind of klutzy and clumsy at it, and then become really good at it. And that's because of this concept of neuroplasticity, where dendrites can continue to sprout. Um, keep in mind, when, when neurons in the CNS get damaged, uh, they, they can't regenerate. And if they do, uh, we just don't have the technology yet to measure it. Um, but, but with neurological rehabilitation, you can sprout new ones and the brain, due to neuroplasticity, it's incredible how certain aspects of the brain can pick up for the slack of a weaker area. Okay, so um, the neural system is sensing things it is interpreting things and processing them, and then it's following out certain commands. And it's constantly in this state of homeostasis where it's turning something on or turning something off, or upregulating or downregulating, or speeding up or slowing down. Okay, so either your muscles, which are highly sensitive, you know, and the way I look at the muscles is that they're, it's, it's an extension of the nerve system. Right, I, I through years I've had patients ask me, "Hey, doc, is this is this a muscular problem or is it like a nerve thing? My back is in spasm and I can't stand up. Is this a muscle thing or is it a nerve thing?" And I've come to appreciate that they're one and the same, right? Because muscles are probably one of the most highly innervated um, organs of the body. Think of what happens when you're cold. Think of what happens. Um, when your body, if you're, if you touch something hot, how quick and rapid you can withdraw and pull away. Um, think of what happens if you reach down and touch your toes and your hamstrings are tight, how your knees bend immediately for that, uh, flexor reflex. Um, muscles know when to try and try harder and then muscles know when to blow out and give out so you don't injure yourself. There are so many neurosensory neurons and motor neurons, it's, it's incredible. So um, muscles and your special senses are constantly sending feedback to the neural system, to the CNS, and then the brain and spinal cord are constantly sending out motor output, not just to the somatic neural system, which is voluntary going to your skeletal muscles, but of course the ANS, the autonomic with sympathetic and parasympathetic. Okay, let's look at this video. I'm really hoping this plays. It's um, about graded potentials and action potentials. Oh, I'm so happy, and I know you are too. So let's take a look at this. Membrane potentials, graded and action potentials. In order to describe the generation of changes in membrane potential, we will use a motor neuron, which stimulates skeletal muscle to contract. The neuron can be divided into three zones. The input zone, consisting of the cell body and extensions known as dendrites, has chemically gated channels in its membrane to receive stimuli from other neurons as graded potentials. These graded potentials move toward the trigger zone at the axon hillock. The right, the axon, remember the dendrites, the cell body, so sensory input is coming in. And then the motor output, it, here's the axon hillock right here, that dilated part. And then we have the trigger zone right in here. And then you can see the little tip of the axon right there. Trigger zone is where voltage gated channels are first encountered in the neuron. If the graded potentials reach threshold in the trigger zone, then an action potential is generated. If the graded potential, I'm going to be showing you some graphs that show this, but it's kind of like a threshold, right? I mean, 
someone can have anger management issues and maybe it takes a certain amount of stimulus to set that individual off. Okay. Um, I may find, I love jokes and I love humor, but for me, you know, it's gotta be real witty to get me to have a belly laugh. Yeah. Certain things get me to giggle. Consider that to be like, you know, a graded potential or certain things get me to smile. That may be a graded potential, but if the stimulus is great enough and it hits my threshold, then I go, <laughs> right. Then I get the belly laugh and you know, everything takes place. So keep, keep that analogy in mind. So graded potential, very small local change only action potential. That's the magic. The action potential is transmitted via voltage gated channels down the axon to the output zone where it causes skeletal muscle to contract. In the input zone, Graded potentials are generated when stimuli such as neurotransmitters attach to receptors of chemically gated ion channels, causing them to open briefly. Now, these neurotransmitters are going to hit this. Let's say this is a presynaptic and here's a postsynaptic. So there's neurotransmitters released and the neurotransmitter is either going to be a message that is excitatory or inhibitory. So what ends up happening on the other side, whether it turns on, turns off, speeds up, or slows down, depends on the neurotransmitter. It's either going to be an excitatory postsynaptic potential, or it's going to be an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. If sodium channels open, creating depolarization or excitation, that's an excitatory postsynaptic potential. And if sodium channels remain closed, but potassium channels open, that's more of an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Okay. And shift in the distribution of ions on either side of the membrane results in a slight change in electrical potential. Graded potentials travel a short distance through an input zone toward the trigger zone before fading away. It is the net voltage produced by graded potentials at the trigger zone that determines if the threshold of voltage gated channels is reached to trigger an action potential. Some graded potentials occur when chemically gated sodium channels open to allow sodium ions to diffuse into the input zone. This electrically moves the trigger zone closer to or above the threshold. They are considered to be depolarizing graded potentials. So just always associate that term depolarizing or depolarization with excitation. It's going to set something off. Okay. And in unhealthy individuals, their membrane potential is always closer to threshold, meaning they're set off easily. These are people perhaps that have fibromyalgia. These are people who are um, ADD or ADHD or hyperactive. It's just things get set off very, very easily because their cell membranes are too close to that threshold. If chemically gated potassium channels in the input zone are stimulated to open, it allows potassium ions to diffuse out of the cell and causes the inside of the membrane to become more negative, moving the voltage in the trigger zone away from the threshold. These inhibiting graded potentials are known as hyperpolarizing graded potentials. Since depolarizing graded potentials cannot individually reach threshold, an insufficient quantity does not cause a response at the trigger zone. If, on the other hand, there are enough of them to reach threshold, an action potential is generated. If there are more hyperpolarizing graded potentials than depolarizing, the net membrane potential in the trigger zone becomes even more negative than the resting potential. This would temporarily inhibit the generation of an action potential or require additional positive stimulation to reach threshold. When the net graded potentials arriving at the axon hillock reach threshold, the action potential begins. Both sodium and potassium voltage gated channels are stimulated to open. Sodium channels open quickly, allowing sodium ions to diffuse in and add positive charges to the inside of Let the cell membrane. Let me rewind that a little bit. I'm sorry about that. Sodium Let's go back. Sodium and potassium at the axon hillock reach threshold.
the action potential begins. Both sodium and potassium voltage-gated channels are stimulated to open. Sodium channels open quick. So I want you to see, so right here, right, minus 70 is considered a resting membrane potential. And minus 55 is the threshold. So anything that takes place under this threshold is considered a graded potential. So you're going to have a cell. And when sodium rushes into the cell, remember, there's more sodium outside than inside. So as sodium starts to rush from outside, you got to visualize this. I want you to visualize. So in, when sodium starts to rush from outside to inside, then the cell membrane potential is becoming less negative or it's moving in a more positive direction. So it'll go from negative 70 to maybe negative 65 to negative 60 to 50, negative 59, 58. That's when some sodium starts to kind of move in a little bit. Now, once minus 55 is hit, the sodium channel kind of has these two gates. It has like a, um, think of it as like two doors to your home. It has like the, the storm door. It's got like the heavy door and the screen door. So let's say the screen door opens, it allows some sodium in, but, but not enough, right? When the heavy wooden door opens, now it allows that sodium that made it through the first gate into the cell and it can move in quicker that way. So you get a much more of a dramatic change in that membrane potential. So now it goes from minus 55. Once the other door opens, all the sodium floods in and rushes in and it drops to negative 40, negative 30, negative 10. You know, it just keeps becoming much more negative. All right. And eventually when it hits and it starts to move up to positive 30, it's jobs done. Sodium channels slam shut. Okay. Slodium, sodium channels slam shut depolarization ends and the potassium channels start to open up so that potassium rushes out and now the membrane starts to move down in a more negative direction and that's called repolarization till it hits RMP, resting membrane potential, which is minus 70. Now the potassium gates don't close very quickly. They're slower to close. So we'll get more of a negative dip. And when it dips more negative than minus 70, that's called hyperpolarization. And that's when the sodium potassium pumps kick in, right? To try and restore it back to resting membrane potential. So RMP, resting membrane potential is minus 70. When the inactivation sodium gates open, some sodium rushes in, so the membrane becomes a little bit more positive. It's moving up in this direction. When it hits minus 55, which is threshold, that other door for sodium, that other gate opens up, and now sodium can flush in, and we get this dramatic spike upward, up to positive 30. And then sodium gates close. And when sodium gates close, and potassium opens, now potassium starts to rush out of the cell and we start to repolarize and we move down, 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 back to minus 70. That's RMP, resting membrane potential. And when it moves a little bit below minus 70, let's say to minus 90, anything below minus 70 is now hyperpolarization. Sodium potassium pump kicks in and restoring it back to RMP, resting membrane potential, okay? I'm going to go over that a few times with a little bit more visual support. Don't you worry. Allowing sodium ions to diffuse in and add positive charges to the inside of the cell membrane. If enough positively charged sodium ions diffuse in to bring the voltage on the inside of the membrane to zero millivolts, it becomes uncharged and we refer to the cell membrane as being depolarized. Sodium channels are only open long enough to allow sufficient amounts of sodium ions to pass through to cause depolarization. At this point, the inactivation gate on the sodium channel closes to block any further inflow of sodium ions. In actuality, 
Before the sodium channels close, enough sodium ions diffuse in to cause the inner surface of the cell membrane to become positively charged. The purpose of the inactivation gate is to prevent the membrane from stimulating itself and causing repeated action potentials. At the same time the sodium channels close, the slower voltage gated potassium channels open and allow potassium ions to rapidly diffuse out of the cell. The removing of positive charges from the inside of the membrane causes its internal surface to become negatively charged again or repolarized. Once enough potassium has diffused out of the cell to cause the inside of the membrane to be below threshold, the inactivation gate of the sodium channel opens as the gates on both types of ion channels close, but not before the inside of the membrane becomes less than the resting potential of minus 70 millivolts to cause the inside to become hyperpolarized. Sodium-potassium pumps transport sodium ions out of the cell and potassium ions into the cell to restore ion concentrations and to, along with leak channels, re-establish its resting membrane potential. The depolarization of one area of the cell membrane causes neighboring voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels to reach their threshold. The result is the action potential spreads like a wave across the entire cell membrane. Once the action potential begins, all of the output zone will depolarize and repolarize. This is known as the all or none principle. In other words, the action potential does not diminish as it travels across the membrane, unlike the graded potential. So either all of the membrane depolarizes and repolarizes, or none of it will. It is also important to note that the amplitude of the action potential is always the same. It is the frequency of the action potentials that signifies a stronger response. Great visual, right? I knew you'd like that. Let's look at membrane potentials. The function of neurons is to allow communication between cells thereby maintaining homeostasis. Electrical signals, called membrane potentials, travel along the membranes of the neurons. Voltage variability and a distance traveled determine the type of nervous signal. Voltage variable short distance signals are called graded potentials. Voltage constant long distance signals are called action potentials. The distribution of charged ions close to a neuron's membrane determines the membrane's electrical potential. This potential is measured in millivolts. A change in voltage results in the generation of a nervous signal. Two characteristics of cell membranes are needed to generate and maintain these potentials. Ion transport proteins in the membrane and resting membrane potentials. Okay, so neurons are electrically excitable uh, due to the voltage difference across their membrane. And communication takes place through two types of electrical signals. One is called an action potential that can travel uh, long distances, and then graded potentials, as we said earlier, that are local membrane changes only. So in living cells, a flow of ions occur through ion channels. Okay, there are sodium channels, there are potassium channels, there are uh, calcium channels. So um, there's, there's gated channels, there's leakage channels, there's um, mechan <clears throat> mechanical channels that we'll look at. So leakage channels alternate between opening and closing. And keep in mind that there are many, many more potassium channels than there are sodium channels. There tends to be a little bit more permeability to potassium than sodium, okay? Ligand channels 
these are the ones that respond to chemical stimuli. So whenever you hear the word ligand, right away your brain should shift to hormones or neurotransmitters, some sort of chemical stimulus. Um, when we did muscles, right, and we talked about the NMJ, we introduced the idea of the um, acetylcholine that is stimulated to be released by calcium influx, right? Calcium influx comes in at the uh, axon terminal and it tells those neurotransmitters in those end bulbs to release ACH, acetylcholine. Acetylcholine crosses that synaptic cleft and then binds to that sodium channel that's closed. And here you could see on the left-hand side this little purple thing would be like uh, a channel, and you could see the pyramid, red, the triangular thing, would be like acetylcholine. And when it binds to it, it opens it up and allows things to pass through that membrane, like sodium, okay? Mechanically gated respond to mechanical vibration or pressure. Um, these things, uh, these type of mechanically gated channels um, help us actually understand why um, certain therapies in, in offices, like I'll do a certain type of vibration therapy where I'll use a very strong mechanical vibration with percussion on patients that are in pain, and it helps to turn down the volume of that. Mechanical vibration and movement really can assist. We hear this all the time where patients often say, when I'm moving, I feel better. It's only at night when I'm lying down where the pain increases, right? Because there's no mechanical movement or vibration taking place. Think of a young child that, that bangs their hand, you know, innately they want to shake it and move it, creating mechanical movement and vibration, right? Or we rub it and we give it some pressure stimulus to, to help which is involved with a massage or even massage therapy. So voltage-gated channels respond to direct changes in membrane potential. We can see that on the left-hand side, the voltage is minus 70 millivolts, right? And that is RMP. But look what happens on the right-hand side when the voltage changes to minus 50 millivolts. That gate opens and it allows those ions to pass through. So there's leakage channels, ligand-gated channels, there's mechanically-gated channels, and voltage channels. Uh, the leakage channels, these randomly open and close. The ligand-gated channels, these are chemically uh, involved. Mechanical, touch, pressure, vibration, tissue stretching, and then voltage-gated, these are when the gates open and close in response to change in uh, membrane potential. If you look at the location of mechanically gated channels, uh, these are found in the dendrites of sensory neurons such as touch receptors and pressure receptors and nociceptors or pain receptors. When you look at the ligand gated, these are found in some of the sensory neurons such as pain receptors and dendrites in the cell bodies of inter neurons or even motor neurons. You know and remember where the interneurons are. Those are also association neurons. Um, the leakage channels, these are always open. So think of it as, um, think of these like in the old, I don't say old days, <laughs> but I remember growing up and before we had like in-ground sprinkler systems, um, we would have these hoses that had like perforated holes in them and you can line the hose in a garden, uh, turn them on and we'd see water leak out through these permeable membrane and, you know, leak out through the entire length of the hose. So think of that as leakage channels and nerve cells have more potassium leakage than sodium leakage channels. And as a result, the membrane permeability of potassium is much, much higher. And it helps to explain this membrane difference of what's happening outside of the cell in relationship to inside and this resting membrane potential of minus 70. That's the magic number, minus 70. 
Um, we already spoke about the gated channels, and the biggies are voltage channels, ligand channels, and mechanically gated, as mentioned before. When we think of ligand, we're thinking hormone, neurotransmitters, and ions being the stimulus that allows the gates to open and close compared to change in voltage opening and closing or mechanically gated being some sort of mechanical stimulation. So on the top, once again, you could see the voltage gate minus 70 on the top left, and you could see right in the middle, it's closed. And on the right hand side, the voltage changes to minus 50, opening that gate. On the bottom left, we have chemical stimulus. That's the ligand gate. We can see acetylcholine, that reddish pyramid that's going to bind to the purple channel. And when it does, it's going to create some sort of stimulation to open up that gate. Minus 70, minus 50, and there's the acetylcholine. Now, <clears throat> there are negative ions along the inside of the cell membrane, and it's more positive ions along the outside. So that potential difference gives us a minus 70. So it's more negative on the inside of the cell membrane and a little bit more positive in relationship on the outside. So when sodium starts to go from outside to inside the cell membrane, you can understand why the membrane potential moves from minus 70 and it moves in a more positive direction, minus 60, minus 55, which is threshold, and then more sodium channels open and sodium rushes in. Uh, the resting membrane potential exists because of the concentration of ions at a different inside and outside, right? More sodium outside, more potassium inside, more chloride outside than inside. So the extracellular fluid is very rich in sodium and chloride, and the cytosol inside is full of potassium, organic phosphates, and amino acids. Okay. The... Um, membrane permeability differs for sodium and potassium, as we mentioned before. There's much greater permeability for potassium. So the inward flow of sodium, it just can't keep up with the outward flow of potassium. So we have these built-in, innate, inherent sodium-potassium pumps that can remove sodium as fast as it's leaking in. You know, think of this as being in a boat. And when you're in a boat, if you have a hole, water keeps coming in. The water that keeps coming in is sodium rushing in, so you have to kind of keep pushing it out. Or it's potassium rushing out, and you got to get it all pumped back in. And in order to do that, you need a bucket. As the water is rushing in, you got to get the bucket and pump it out. It keeps coming back in, so you get the bucket and pump it out. And every time sodium is rushing in and you're trying to pump it out, that takes energy right? It takes energy in order to do that. So that's ATP. Um, the membrane of a non-conducting neuron is positive outside, as we mentioned, and negative inside, and it's determined by an unequal distribution of ions across the cell membrane, and that selectively permeability of the neuron's membrane to sodium and potassium. Most anions cannot leave the cell, right? So cations are positively charged, anions are negatively charged. And then we have these sodium potassium pumps. So you can see uh, on the left hand side in the light blue, this is extracellular fluid. And on the bottom is the cytosol. And here's the membrane. Okay, and the resting membrane potential is an electrical potential difference across the cell membrane. Outside, it's a little bit more positive, inside, a little bit more negative. Okay. When you look at the charge, you can see it's uh, negative 70 millivolts. Factors that contribute, we have potassium leakage channels, we have some sodium leakage channels, uh, and then here, there's that sodium potassium pump, and let's take a look at it. It's responsible for pumping three sodiums out of the cell while pumping two potassiums back in. But that requires ATP because it's moving things against their concentration gradient. It's not moving with, it's moving against, right? Because sodium was moving in. And now here we're moving sodium out. When there are small deviations, as that video sh showed earlier and I was trying to explain, 
any slight deviation, if you look on the bottom, here's RMP, which is minus 70. You can see that it's moving up to minus 60. Did it hit minus 55? Minus 55, remember, was threshold. If it doesn't, then that is simply a graded potential. Once you start to move in a more negative direction, below the minus 70, now we're talking about hyperpolarization, hyperpolarizing, hyperpolarization. Okay, um, a graded potential occurs in response to the opening of mechanically gated or ligand gated channels. So again, graded potentials, local, and when you talk about action potentials, now we're talking about really hitting that threshold. And we can see uh, applied pressure can influence that, uh, binding of acetylcholine, binding of a, a amino acid, glycine, which these are all chemicals, chemicals, so these are associated with ligands. The applied pressure is more mechanically gated. <clears throat> <clears throat> Again, so these are just graded potentials because you can see minus 55 hasn't been hit yet. It's got to be a, a pretty strong stimulus. Otherwise, it's just going to come right back down to resting membrane potentials. Okay. An action potential is a sequence of rapidly occurring events that decrease and eventually reverse the membrane potential, depolarization, and eventually restore it back to its resting state, repolarization. So again, graded potential on the right-hand side is moving in a more positive direction, but it hasn't quite hit threshold, which was minus 55. And hyperpolarization is when you're moving in a more negative direction. So depolarization is when the membrane's becoming more positive, meaning it's moving towards RMP, but it's not moving in a more... Uh, let, let me let me rephrase that. When you're moving in an upward direction, in a more positive direction, that's depolarization. When you start moving in a more negative direction, that's repolarization. But graded, that term graded means, look, it hasn't really hit that minus 55 yet. If it hits the minus 55, it moves up to positive 30, that's depolarization for sure. And now we start repolarizing it, meaning we're restoring it back to minus 70. So we're moving in a negative direction. When it moves more negative than resting membrane potential, that's hyperpolarization. So I want to make <clears throat> a correction here. Hyperpolarization isn't that the membrane's becoming more negative is that it's becoming more negative than RMP, right? Because when you go from positive 30 to minus 50, that's becoming more negative, but that's repolarization. It's when it goes more negative than RMP, that's called hyperpolarization, okay? So this is a great picture that describes exactly what I just said. So let's look here at all the way on the left, we have minus 70, which is RMP. And we have resting membrane potential. We look at the color, that violet color. We're at RMP. The voltage-gated sodium channels are in a resting state, and so are the voltage-gated potassium channels. But now there's some stimulus that's causing depolarization to threshold. So from here to here, we could say that one of the gates are open, right? One of those gates is open, allowing some sodium to rush in. Right, So when enough of that sodium rushes in and hits this, boom, the second sodium gate opens in that same channel. When that second opens up, there's a rapid spike because now sodium can really, really rush into the cell extremely fast till it hits positive 30, then boom, voltage-gated uh, activation um, channels the voltage-gated sodium channels are open right up into this point, but then they shut. Boom. When they shut, the voltage potassium channels are opening, but the sodium channels are inactivating. It means that they're closed. 
and when they close and potassium rushes out, now we start moving downward in a more negative direction. So that's repolarization. But as you move down, 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 and it hits that minus 55 and it moves to minus 70, which we know is resting membrane, the potassium channels shut much, much slower. So it continues to move more in a negative direction, and that's hyperpolarization. Okay, during an absolute refractory period here in this phase, which is anything in this upswing, another action potential cannot be generated. The sodium channels must be closed in this relative refractory period, which is in the downward swing. That's when another action potential can actually take place. Okay, and when this happens, when that threshold is met, it's called the all or none principle right? That's when that action potential takes place. There's no turning back. Okay, so again, a chemical or mechanical stimulus causes greater potential to reach that minus 55 or threshold, at which point the voltage-gated sodium channels open and sodium rushes into the cell, boom, spiking it up here. All right, and then what ends up happening is at that minus 50 once you hit that positive 30, let me bring this back here. Oh. How come I can't get that to stay? Okay. All right. So we had, we had already explained it. So once we hit that positive 30, repolarizing phase is this red downward swing. Right, but you can see that it's the red is going from here where the sodium channel closes, potassium is open, potassium is rushing out of the cell, and look at that red line. The red line comes down and it stops right at minus 70. The brown downward swing is what hyperpolarization is. As we mentioned earlier, um, the refractory period is the period of time which neurons cannot generate another action potential, but it's the relative refractory period. In the absolute refractory period, absolutely not. I want to make sure you, you're aware of that. In the absolute refractory period, you absolutely cannot generate another action potential. But in the relative refractory period, a super threshold can initiate another action potential. So the sodium channels have to be closed in order for another action potential to be created. So <clears throat> resting membrane potential is minus 70 millivolts. Depolarization is when you're going from RMP up to positive 30. And then repolarization is when you're going from positive 30 back to minus 70. When you're going from minus 70 to minus 90, what is that called? Good, that's called hyperpolarization. Now, the propagation of action potentials, the action potential spreads or propagates over the surface of an axon membrane. As sodium flows into the cell during depolarization, the voltage of adjacent areas are affected and their voltage-gated sodium channels open. So it can self-propagate and spread along that membrane and that's called an action potential or a nerve impulse. If you want to prevent opening of the voltage-gated sodium channels, those are things like vibration, um, those are things like ice, those are things like lidocaine and novocaine. Those are the things that can actually stop the sodium gates from opening or at least slow them down so the person is feeling less pain. Other factors that affect the conduction rates are myelination. Let's see if we can get this one to run. Propagation of action potentials along axons of neurons that are not covered by a myelin sheath requires that all of the membrane must undergo depolarization. This kind of conduction occurs along unmyelinated axons and is called continuous conduction. In the peripheral nervous system, Schwann cells form myelin sheaths by wrapping their cell membranes in multiple layers around an axon. The axon is now electrically insulated except for the gaps, called nodes of Ranvier, where the membrane is exposed. Because myelin electrically insulates an axon and prevents ion currents across the membrane, 
Depolarization of myelinated axons occurs only at the nodes of Ranvier. So I want you to look at that and see as the saltatory from the word saltare, it means to leap or to jump. So as the action potential moves down from the axon hillock in the trigger zone and it starts moving down this myelinated axon, it leaps, it jumps from where it's non-myelinated, the node of Ranvier, to the next. And wherever there's myelin, it moves super quick, then it jumps and it moves quick. All right, compared to continuous conduction is a little much slower than that. This form of conduction, where the signal appears to leap from node to node, is called saltatory conduction. Energy efficiency and longer distance between depolarization sites make saltatory conduction much more rapid than continuous conduction. Saltatory is faster, you can see. Continuous conduction is much slower. So myelin speeds up the conduction rate. Again, continuous conduction is unmyelinated fibers. It's a step-by-step -step depolarization for each portion of the length of the axolemma, whereas saltatory conduction is depolarization takes place only at the nodes of Ranvier. Okay, it moves very quickly. You can see here, this is very similar to the um, animation that we just saw. So on the left-hand side, you see it's continuous conduction. On the right-hand side, saltatory conduction. And here you can see what's happening at one millisecond, five milliseconds, and 10 milliseconds. Between one and five milliseconds, and you look at the action potential for continuous and compare it to saltatory, it's about the same as is right in the beginning. But once we hit 10 milliseconds, look where the action potential is in continuous versus where it is at 10 milliseconds in saltatory. It's almost at the end of the axon terminal. So um, axon diameter, myelin, and temperature do have an effect on the speed of propagation. Let's take a look again here. Propagation of action potentials along axons of neurons that are not covered by a myelin sheath requires that all of the membrane must undergo depolarization. This kind of conduction occurs along unmyelinated axons and is called continuous conduction. Much slower. In the peripheral nervous system, Schwann cells form myelin sheaths by wrapping their cell membranes in multiple layers around an axon. Schwann cells. The axon is now electrically insulated except for the gaps, called nodes of Ranvier, where the membrane is exposed. Because myelin electrically insulates an axon and prevents ion currents across the membrane, depolarization of myelinated axons occurs only at the nodes of Ranvier. This form of conduction, where the signal appears to leap from node to node, is called saltatory conduction. Energy efficiency and longer distance between depolarization sites make saltatory conduction much more rapid than continuous conduction. Okay, I wanted to show that again because it's an, an important concept that helps us understand the importance of myelin, the importance of fats in the diet, cholesterol in the diet. Um, it helps us understand why MS or multiple sclerosis is a neurological issue where the neurons demyelinate, axons demyelinate, nerves demyelinate. And when it happens in the PNS, that can regenerate, but when it happens in the CNS, it cannot regenerate. Um, in terms of diameter, the propagation of the speed of the nerve impulses are not so much related to the stimulus strength, but the larger the fiber, the myelinated fibers, these are uh, very fast, quick impulses, and we know saltatory conduction. In terms of fiber size, a, type A fibers are the largest, B are a little bit smaller than that, and the C are the smallest fibers. So A fibers, these are myelinated uh, somatic sensory and motor to skeletal muscles. And then the B fibers are myelinated but smaller visceral sensory 
and going to the autonomic preganglionic fibers. And C fibers are the smallest, and they're also unmyelinated sensory and autonomic motor, so these are much, much slower. So if we look at the largest fibers, the, these impulses can move 130 meters per second, whereas the C fibers can move two meters per second. So major difference in speed there. So if something is hot, you want to get that message quick and withdraw fast, super quickly. The resting membrane potential of nerve impulses are uh, of nerves are minus 70 millivolts. For skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit closer to minus 90 uh, millivolts. All right, let's look a little bit about synapses. Um, there are electrical synapses and chemical synapses. Um, the synapse is the junction between two neurons or between a neuron and an effector such as the neuromuscular junction. Um, in electrical synapse, there are gap junctions that connect cells and allow the transfer of information to synchronize the activity of these group of cells. A chemical synapse is a one-way transfer of information. It goes from a presynaptic neuron to a postsynaptic neuron. That's a chemical synapse. So here, we can see a cell body or a neuron right there in the center. And then we can see that we have these different connections to it, going from an axon to a dendrite, going from an axon to an axon, or going from the axon to the actual soma or the cell body. Now, action potentials reach reaches the end bulb and these voltage-gated calcium channels open. So right over here, we can see that calcium influxes in, and that influx is gonna stimulate these end bulbs to release their neurotransmitter. So this is the presynaptic side, and this is the postsynaptic side. The postsynaptic side has these channels. When the acetylcholine is released, or that neurotransmitter, whatever it may be, is released, that channel opens and allows a continuation of the action potential. Now, in this case, it's excitatory, so it allowed for depolarization, but sometimes they are inhibitory. So again, we can see calcium influx. We see the action potential coming down at number one. Then we see calcium influx at number two, all throughout that um, uh, axon terminal. And then we see number three, we see these many, many synaptic vessels and that have these protein in it or neurotransmitter, and it's going to release it in the synaptic cleft. It's going to cross to the postsynaptic side and bind to that channel and open it to allow for the postsynaptic potential to create an action potential or a nerve impulse. Let's look at the events at the synapse. In order to provide communication among the cells of the body, the billions of neurons in the nervous system must first communicate with one another or with effector cells via synapses. Synapses allow information to be filtered and integrated. Synapses are either electrical or chemical. Electrical synapses are called gap junctions and have many ion channels called connexons connecting two adjacent cells. Electrical synapses allow quicker communication, more coordinated communication between cells, and two-way transmission. A physical separation between adjacent cells, called the synaptic cleft, is a characteristic of chemical synapses. Because action potentials cannot cross a synaptic cleft, this electrical signal is converted into a chemical signal using neurotransmitters to cross the cleft. Unlike electrical synapses that allow for two-way transmission of signals, communication at a chemical synapse is one way only, from presynaptic to postsynaptic membranes. A series of events occur at chemical synapses in order to communicate with the adjacent cell. When the action potential arrives at the presynaptic membrane, its depolarization phase opens voltage-gated calcium channels, 
allowing the inflow of calcium ions from the extracellular fluid. Increased calcium in the cytosol triggers exocytosis of synaptic vesicles carrying neurotransmitter chemicals, releasing them into the synaptic cleft. Neurotransmitters diffuse across the cleft and bind to receptors, often ligand-gated ion channels. Gated channels open, allowing ions to flow according to their concentration gradient. Sodium entering the cell makes the interior slightly more positive. Potassium leaving the cell makes the interior slightly less positive. Depending on which ions enter the postsynaptic cell through the channels, the ionic flow will cause either a graded depolarization or a hyperpolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. Large graded depolarizations tend to generate action potentials. If depolarization is an above-threshold voltage, then an action potential will be generated. The neurotransmitters bind to specific ligand-gated ion channels in the postsynaptic membrane. This is important stuff here. A graded depolarization or hyperpolarization will occur, depending upon which channels open to ionic flow. Depolarizations, the result of sodium gates opening, stimulate the generation of action potentials. These depolarizations are known as excitatory postsynaptic membrane potentials, or EPSPs. Acetylcholine does that at the NMJ. Hyperpolarizations, the result of chlorine or potassium gates opening, inhibit the generation of action potentials. These hyperpolarizations are known as inhibitory postsynaptic membrane potentials, or IPSPs. Valerian root. The sum of all IPSPs and EPSPs from all synapses determines whether an action potential will be generated at a neuron's trigger zone. That's the summation, the accumulation of all. summation. <clears throat> a typical neuron may have thousands of synapses. The neuron will have a corresponding number of postsynaptic membrane potentials summed at its trigger zone. Spatial summation results from the effect of potentials coming from many different synapses. Or it could be one firing Temporal over summation and over. results from the effect of potentials coming from one location or synapse, but many times in succession. That's temporal. Temporal summation. Summation can result in three possible scenarios. Temporal summation is like one student telling the professor, I don't want the test today. 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 I don't want the test today, right? Over and over and over. And spatial summation is when you have an entire class of students just saying it once, right? The message from a hundred students leaves much more of a powerful impression on the professor than does one student saying it over and over and over, okay? So the spatial is much more quicker and faster than temporal, okay? IPSPs and EPSPs may summate and result in hyperpolarization of the membrane. In this case, no action potential will be generated. Or IPSPs and EPSPs summate, resulting in a subthreshold depolarization of the membrane. Again, no action potential can be generated. Or, IPSPs and EPSPs summate, resulting in an above-threshold depolarization. Now, an action potential is generated. Okay, let's look at Synapses continued with neurotransmitter action.
The nervous system is composed of billions of communicating cells called neurons. Neurons conduct electrical signals or action potentials along the cell's membrane, along the axon, to the terminus, where synapses are formed. The synapse consists of the membrane of the presynaptic cell, a synaptic cleft, and the postsynaptic cell membrane. Since an action potential can only propagate along the neuron's membrane, a chemical known as a neurotransmitter must bridge the gap between the adjacent cells. The presynaptic cell releases the neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft, where they will move to bind the receptor proteins in the postsynaptic cell membrane. When the action potential arrives at the synapse, it opens voltage-gated calcium channels, resulting in an inward flow of calcium. The calcium binds to the vesicular membrane. This binding activates the vesicles to fuse with the presynaptic membrane. As fusion occurs, neurotransmitter molecules are released into the synaptic cleft. Once in the cleft, the neurotransmitter molecules diffuse throughout the interstitial fluid in the cleft. Some of the neurotransmitters will cross the synaptic cleft and bind with receptors in the postsynaptic membrane. This binding produces an effect in the postsynaptic cell by opening the protein channels and allowing the flow of ions into and out of the cell. If the effect of the neurotransmitter excites the postsynaptic membrane, an excitatory postsynaptic membrane potential, also known as EPSP, is generated. This localized depolarizing signal generally causes long-distance signals, action potentials, in the dendrite of the postsynaptic cell. If the effect of the neurotransmitter inhibits the postsynaptic membrane and inhibitory postsynaptic membrane potential, also known as an IPSP, is generated, this localized hyperpolarizing signal generally prevents the formation of long-distance signals in the postsynaptic cell. Neurotransmitters influence the postsynaptic membrane electrical state for only a short time and are removed from the synaptic cleft in one of three ways, diffusion away from the receptors, enzymatically degraded, or recycled by the presynaptic cell. Some of the neurotransmitter molecules diffuse out of reach of the neurotransmitter receptors. Some neurotransmitter molecules are removed by enzymatic degradation. Some neurotransmitter molecules are transported back into the presynaptic cell by neurotransmitter transporter proteins, where they are recycled. An example of a specific neurotransmitter that functions in these ways is serotonin. Some serotonin will cross the synaptic cleft and bind with the specific serotonin receptors within the membrane of the postsynaptic cell, producing an effect in the target cell. Serotonin will eventually unbind from the receptors and either diffuse out of the synaptic cleft and be lost, or be captured by the serotonin reuptake transporter in the presynaptic membrane. This protein complex will transport the biologically active serotonin back into the presynaptic neuron for repackaging and re-release. Acetylcholine, the first neurotransmitter discovered, also diffuses across the synaptic cleft and temporarily binds with its specific membrane-bound receptor on the postsynaptic cell, affecting the cell's electrical state. Some acetylcholine in the cleft will interact with the enzyme acetylcholinesterase, which will hydrolyze the acetylcholine molecule into acetate and choline. Acetate diffuses away, but choline interacts with the presynaptic membrane-bound transporter to be recycled in the presynaptic neuron into new acetylcholine. Unlike serotonin, which is intact and biologically active following its uptake into the presynaptic cell, new synthesis of acetylcholine is necessary, with the recycled choline as the precursor. Okay. <clears throat> So 
So the effects of neurotransmitters can either be excitatory or inhibitory. A depolarizing postsynaptic potential is called an EPSP or an excitatory postsynaptic potential. And as we said, it results from the opening of the ligand sodium channels. And if the postsynaptic, and that's when the postsynaptic cell is likely to reach threshold. The IPSP, the inhibitory postsynaptic potential, results from the opening of the potassium and chloride channels, and it's going to cause the postsynaptic cell to become more negative or hyperpolarized. So the further away from threshold it meets, the less likely it is to become excited, right? So it's less likely to hit threshold in an IPSP. So the EPSP is a depolarizing postsynaptic potential. The IPSP is when it hyperpolarizes. Neurotransmitters at the chemical synapses can either create an excitatory or an inhibitory message. We have certain neurotransmitters that you can see on the right-hand side that are excitatory and certain ones that are inhibitory. And it really depends on a combination of the neurotransmitter as well as the receptor. They both have unique communication because in certain cell membranes, acetylcholine can be excitatory, such as in skeletal muscle, but acetylcholine can also be inhibitory in other tissues. GABA is inhibitory for sure. Gamma amino butyric acid, GABA. Um, that's inhibitory. Glutamate is very excitatory. And glutamate being um, very excitatory should be more dominant, especially in the morning. That helps you kind of get up in the morning, right? Kind of be glutamate dominant. And glutamate can convert itself throughout the day into, from glutamate to a more inhibitory neurotransmitter that tends to become more dominant uh, in the evening time. So if you're glutamate dominant, then all of a sudden you're waking up very easily. If you're glutamate deficient in the morning, then that's the person that hits the, you know, the, the snooze button quite often. They may be GABA dominant. So then they're like, I don't want to get up. I'm so tired, right? Um, when you're glutamate dominant at night, which it shouldn't be, these are the people that stay up all night. They can't go to sleep, okay? <clears throat> now, when you don't need these neurotransmitters, then they can be degraded or eliminated in a variety of ways. Number one, they diffuse. They just going from a higher concentration to a lesser concentration, or there's enzymatic degradation where they're just broken down, like acetylcholine is broken down by acetylcholine esterase, or we have these neurotransmitter transporters where they're blocked. So the uptake of the neuron or the reuptake is blocked, such as in drugs and medications like Prozac. Prozac is an SSRI or a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. What that does is it's going to allow the serotonin to linger in the synaptic cleft for a longer period of time before the body repackages it and brings it back. Okay. <clears throat> the spatial summation, if we go back and forth and we look at the amount of time it takes for an action potential to be generated, it looks like here we're looking at somewhere around like about 40 milliseconds in spatial summation. This is where we have many presynaptic neurons firing on a postsynaptic. This is where you have not one student, but many students telling the one professor, we don't want an exam today, right? I'll get the message pretty quickly. But if it's one student, I don't want the exam today, 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 you know, that's going to depolarize much later. It looks like 65 milliseconds. It's kind of like touching someone or tapping them on their shoulder to get their attention over and over and over again, poking them versus one, you know, solid hit at one time, okay? 
So the summation of postsynaptic potentials, so here we have presynaptic neuron 1, presynaptic neuron 2, presynaptic neuron 3, 4, and 5, and it just depends which one is stronger. You have an excitatory postsynaptic potential, inhibitory, excitatory, inhibitory, excitatory. It's going to gather all that in information, and whichever is the strongest one is going to win. Neurotransmitters' effects can be modified in a variety of ways. The synthesis can be stimulated or inhibited. The release of it could be stimulated or inhibited or blocked or enhanced. The removal could be stimulated or blocked, and the receptor sites could be blocked or activated. An agonist is anything that's going to enhance the neurotransmitter's effect, whereas an antagonist is anything that's going to block it. There are small molecule neurotransmitters, acetylcholine, amino acids, uh, biogenic amines, ATP, nitric oxide, carbon monoxide. These all act as chemical messengers, but they're all neurotransmitters. Whether it's acetylcholine, nitric oxide, carbon monoxide, Look at the biogenic amines, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin. Look at some of the amino acids. We've got glutamate, that's excitatory. Glycine is usually inhibitory. We have GABA, inhibitory. Aspartate, excitatory. So these amino acids can act as neurotransmitters. So can these biogenic amines, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, and these can be upregulated and downregulated depending on nutrition, depending on your vitamins and your minerals and many cofactors. <clears throat> there are neuropeptides, uh, substance P, which is for pain perception, um, enkephalons, endorphins, angiotensin II, cholecystokinin, these are all neuropeptides. We'll learn a little bit more about angiotensin uh, 1 and angiotensin 2 when we get into the cardiovascular system. We'll talk about cholecystokinin when we get into the digestive tract, and we'll talk about the hypothalamus when we get into the brain and also the endocrine system. Um, substance P is released by mast cells, and they allow you to perceive pain. And this is how a lot of the topical analgesics work. Um, where the mast cells release histamine, which are going to help signal pain. Um, if you put on a topical analgesic, you know, like a biofreeze or icy hot, how people feel like, oh my God, that's burning. Oh my God, it's so hot. It's so cold. It's so hot. It's so cold. And then after a while, you don't feel anything and you actually feel better. It's because the substance P actually got burned out. The mast cells within that area had no more substance P to push out. It pushed it all out to enhance your perception of the icy hot or cold sensation. And there's none left. So you're not perceiving the pain of the joint or the muscle. So, you know, it's kind of interesting how we can manipulate those. So uh, these are some of the descriptions of the uh, neuropeptides. So substance P you should be familiar with, um, angiotensin II, CCK, and neuropeptide uh, gamma. You should be familiar with those, okay? So you can pause it and just take some notes on that. Acetylcholine, we said, is an excitatory at the NMJ, but inhibitory at other areas. And we know it's inactivated by acetylcholine esterase. Uh, glutamate is released by nearly all excitatory neurons in the brain, and it's inactivated by glutamate-specific uh, transporters or the reuptake of them. GABA is inhibitory for about a third of all brain synapses. Now, you've heard of Valium, which comes from valerian root. Um, there's many formulas that I have that I use in my office that have valerian root in it that uh, we use to help calm people down. It's utilized to relax muscles, relax very active brains. Um, so uh, Valium is a GABA agonist. So GABA is inhibitory. So once you're agonizing something that's inhibitory, you're making it more inhibitory, okay? The biogenic amines like norepinephrine and dopamine and serotonin, very, very important. Uh, norepinephrine helps to regulate the mood. Dopamine also is involved in regulating muscle tone. You know, when there's a dopamine deficiency, that's what Parkinson's is. It's when the substantia nigra of the midbrain is not pushing out enough dopamine. 
but dopamine is also part of the reward cascade. Um, I hate to be so blunt, but you know, these things will help you remember. When I was in school, we used to learn the dopamine reward system is wine, dine, and 69, which means alcohol, food, and sex tend to be very, very addictive. So is gambling very addictive because of the dopamine rush, chocolate, smoking, uh, food, all tend to increase dopamine. Uh, sex increases dopamine. And who doesn't want to feel good, right? So when behaviors or certain things make you feel good, you want to do more of those things, which is why some of the most difficult um, challenges to overcome and addictions tends to be food, right? Because food is needed for survival and uh, alcohol is not needed for survival, not saying it's not a challenging um, disease, but alcohol isn't needed to survive or as food is. So having food within your environment really becomes challenging for people. And serotonin is also involved with controlling of mood and temperature and helping to induce sleep. ATP is excitatory in both the CNS and PNS, and it's released with other uh, neurotransmitters such as acetylcholine and norepinephrine. Certain gases like nitric oxide or NO, this comes from a protein, right? So you have to have protein, you need to have a digestive enzymes in the stomach, and then it's the amino acid arginine um, is where nitric oxide comes from. Uh, it was first recognized as a vasodilator, and when you have vasodilation, you help to lower blood pressure. Um, so you ever see those commercials for Viagra? It's a vasodilator. It's used to treat erectile dysfunction. So when there's vasodilation to the blood vessels of the penis, then the soldier can salute. Then there's an erection. Okay, so they tell you if you have blood pressure issues, be very, very careful because vasodilation can lower blood pressure. <clears throat> All right, we already spoke about substance P, which, which enhances our pain perception. The encephalons are pain, have pain relieving effect by blocking the release of substance P. And there's a lot of things that can be done um, within manual medicine and acupuncture to affect endorphins and dynorphins and encephalons, and even in the nutritional realm as well. Plasticity, um, is maintained throughout life. It means that we're able to sprout new dendrites. Um, we can synthesize it's, uh, the synthesis of new proteins, and it allows changes in synaptic contacts with other neurons. There is limited ability to, re to regenerate and repair. Um, we said earlier in the lecture that if there's damage in the PNS, they, there can be dendritic or axonal repair, but when it's in the brain and spinal cord or anywhere in the CNS, the repairs are not uh, possible. And if so, we just don't have technology that's measuring it just yet. But neuroplasticity means that you can retrain the body to sprout new dendrites. Um, in the CNS, we said that there's little or no repair. Uh, due to the inhibitory influences from neuroglial cells, particularly oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes cannot regenerate um, new myelin in the uh, repair myelin within the central neural system. There's also the absence of growth stimulating cues that were present during fetal development. And in the CNS, there's just rapid formation of scar tissue that takes place. The formation of new neurons from stem cells was not thought to occur in humans, but in 1992, a growth factor was found that stimulated adult mice brain cells to multiply. And in 1998, new neurons were found to form within the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is part of learning. So we know that we can learn how to um, do new sports and exercises as we age. And the more we do it, the easier it becomes. Um, I remember Larry Bird, a uh, famous basketball player, used to get to the arena a few hours early and just envision taking basketball shots from every single location on the basketball court over and over and over so that no matter where he was, his body was trained to make that shot. Okay, because 
his neuromuscle, the plasticity and the neuromuscular education and re-education of doing it over and over and over was there. So there would be the familiarity of doing it. The um, factors that prevent neurogenesis in the CNS is the inhibition by the neuroglial cells, the absence, as we said, of the growth stimulating factors and the lack of neurolemmas and the formation of scar tissue. Um, in terms of autoimmune conditions, we mentioned MS, which affects, you know, about half a million people in the U.S. It can occur between the ages of 20 and 40, twice as common in females than males. Females tend to have a stronger immune system than males, and I think of it as a pit bull. Um, you know, every now and then, the pit bull can turn on its rightful owner. And every now and then, that very, very strong immune system can turn on its rightful owner. Unfortunately, uh, symptoms include muscle weakness, abnormal sensation, and double vision. And remissions can take place. Um, I have a patient who I who I still take care of, but she came to me about twenty over twenty years ago, and she was a black belt at the time in her early forties. Uh, and when she came to me, it was for wellness care, and uh, I was taking care of her mother as well, and I was then taking care of her children. So it was three generations, and now I take care of her children's children. So actually four generations of people now. And the, um, we'll call her uh, Mary. Okay, it's not her name, but we'll call her Mary. Uh, Mary came in just for wellness care, and a few weeks into care, she told me that a very odd symptom was taking place where in which she experienced a few years prior. And a few years prior, she was not under my care and I didn't even know her. So the symptom was that two years prior, she was experiencing visual disturbances in both of her eyes. And oddly, she started my care and one of those symptoms came back and it was the symptom of visual disturbances, but just in one eye. So this was actually the first few months of my practice. And um, I pretty much said, well, whatever it is, it's getting better. Right. I mean, I didn't take, she's a healthy, athletic individual, uh, perfect health history, um, nothing else to indicate anything. And um, I said, all right, well, you know, no pun intended, but we'll keep an eye on it. And um, anyway, the symptom dissipated. But then about a few months later, she said that it came back and she started now to experience some weakness in her hand and her legs felt very heavy. Now, at that point in time, it led me to think that there's something else going on. So I sent her for an MRI, and the MRI of the brain showed optic nerve de uh, demyelination. Now, the optic nerve is part of the PNS, and it was only one optic nerve, not both. So what she was experiencing a few years prior was demyelination of both, but since the PNS can regenerate myelin, one of her optic nerves regenerated, and the other had not. Today, all these years later, the other optic nerve fully regenerated, but it spread to the CNS. So it started to slowly degenerate and she went from um, walking and being a black belt to needing a cane to needing a walker. And now, uh, unfortunately, she is in a wheelchair. Now, this woman, what set it off was a few things. Uh, she never knew she was MTHFR positive. And when she, the symptoms started to come, and I knew some of her family history, which involved a brother who died in the 1970s from a vaccination. And it was one of the earlier, earlier lawsuits that ever took place against the pharmaceutical company back in 1972, to be exact. Um, I, I still have the news clipping, April 26, 1972, where she sued the pharmaceutical company because her child developed post-vaccinal encephalitis, and then several years later, that child had died at the age of, I believe, six or seven. Um, but there was mental retardation that set in, and then, uh, unfortunately, death. Now... Back then, remember, there was no social media, there was no Facebook, there was no National Vaccine Information Center, there was no Barbara Lowe Fisher, there were no advocacy groups, there were no support groups. Um, and 
the second child, which is my patient, we'll call her Mary, she too was vaccinated. Now, this child was strong enough and lived, but has developed this neurological disease later on in life. And um, years ago, I became aware of this MTHFR SNP, and when I tested her for it, she had it. So it's kind of like, you know, if you are going to vaccinate, um, I believe it's important to do it safely and wisely and do some genetic testing first. Um, I have three children and none of them have ever uh, been vaccinated. Uh, they're all superior in health. They've all been under great nutritional care and um, neurological care with chiropractic care by myself since the moment of birth. Um, I myself have not received any vaccines um, or boosters or anything uh, after the age of 17 when I became more aware and um, I complied with the New York State public health law, uh, which thank goodness and thank God has a sincere uh, religious belief system. So as a result, um, I'm allowed to be in public schools and universities and my children are all allowed to be in public school system, not uh, being vaccinated, and I'm very, very happy to report that we're not alone, that there's many, many children in our public school district that are not, so my children uh, don't feel like outcasts like, you know, they would have probably 15 or 20 years ago. Um, so now, just showing you how far and how far your actions and words and education, how they can affect people, so as a result, now she's on a very specific form of, uh, you know, folate, MTHF. Her children were tested. Her children are no longer uh, vaccinated as a result because they have part of that SNP. And their children, who I also take care of, that are now uh, all, both under the age of three, um, are not vaccinated as well. Okay? because it takes any type of stress to set that off. Um, it could be chemical stress, physical stress, or emotional stress. In Mary's case, it was the combination of being pre-genetically engineered for perhaps neurological disease where her brother couldn't adapt and was uh, killed by it. Um, and then the emotional stresses of having a major, major, major family um, outing where um, when I say outing, the family split at an event and took years for them to get back together. And that really uh, stressed her out. And that's where this thing took a downward spiral. And she went from a cane to a walker to a wheelchair in less than four months. Okay. And once that gene expresses itself as a phenotype, it's very, very difficult and challenging to get it back. Um, I can say that it has not progressed um, in about eight years. Um, it's kind of maintained itself uh, based on MRI imaging, um, but you know she's not walking and she'll probably unfortunately never get out of that wheelchair again. And I've known this family for a very, very long time. And you know they had these dreams of retiring and traveling the world and um, you know things can change. And uh, that's why it's really important to kind of, you know, be in the moment, be in the present moment and um, do what you, you know, don't procrastinate. If there's something you want to do, do it now and um, make healthy, healthy choices to the best of your knowledge. Okay. Epilepsy. Uh, this is the second most common neurological disorder affects uh, about 1% of the population. And it's characterized by these short recurrent attacks of initiated electrical discharges in the brain. And anything can set it off from light to noise to smells. It's when there's skeletal muscle um, contraction that happens involuntarily. And people can even lose consciousness. And there are many causes. It could happen from brain damage at birth. There are metabolic disturbances that take place. There are infections, toxins, there's vascular disturbances, uh, TBIs, traumatic brain injuries and tumors uh, that can cause that. And then just a, a good review of the diagram of the primary uh, structure of the neuron, which is the functional unit of the neural system. 
There's the dendrites and their functions. There's the cell body and its function, the axon and the axon hillock and their function, and then the axon terminal with their end bulbs and their functions. So you probably want to pause that page, take a look. It's everything that we covered already, so it's just a really good overview. All right, everybody, I know that was um, a nice lengthy lecture. We hope you enjoyed it.